All right. Welcome to the stream. How's it going? I'm Agent Ultra, and we're going to hack on some Haskell tonight. Been a little feisty. I've been talking about maybe doing some game dev and Haskell. Um, and we've been do it, kind of doing like an adventure game engine, an interactive fiction engine, but I was thinking something a little bit more arcadey. Um, just to shake it up a little bit. Um, yeah, and have some fun for, for a bit. So, uh, one of the things that kind of like I did a, a little while ago was um, make a, a game in the JS13K game competition. We talked a lot about it a little bit. And I've been thinking about maybe doing like a serious version of the game. Um, but I'm kind of like on the fence about whether I should do it and try and do it in Haskell. Or if I should use like a conventional game engine like Godot or something like that. Um, so in order to like dip my toes and increase my confidence of the viability of possibly doing it in Haskell, just because the consequences of me succeed, I don't really care if the game succeeds or not. I just want to do it for fun. Um, that, you know, if it's just a back 40 kind of thing, why not do it in a unconventional language in an unconventional way for making games? Why not? Right. Um, yeah, so, but I'm not going to go a whole hog on it right off the bat, right? Like, uh, it might just be a better idea to do, a, do it in an engine um, if it's going to be, like, a big hassle. But uh, we can still, like, have a little fun and kind of dip our toes in and try, like, something a little bit more. Like, we've done Snake on the stream before in Haskell, um, which was fun. Right, but uh, you might recall if you were there for that stream that we didn't really get the game loop like right for a, like a more phys arcade physics style kind of game, um, which, which is what the game I made for the competition is need, like requires, and anything more sophisticated than probably Snake or like something turn based is going to need a little bit more um, oomph. So. Why do we do that? Uh, I don't know if I've upgraded a stack in a while, so I'm gonna upgrade. Just make sure we got the latest and greatest. I do not, so there we go, we're the new version. We'll update our references and snapshots and mirrors, and we'll get a project started. Let's see if we can't figure this out. Oh, chat. I'm just checking on you. All right. I'm going to try and pay more attention here tonight. So if you've got any questions, comments, concerns, <laughs> you want to you wanna voice your opinion about game dev and Haskell and why it's a bad language to be making games in, let me know. Let me know what you think. Okay, we got the newest version of Stack. Uh, so let's start a Stack new. Um... I'm just, just going to call it, it was a Death 13K. I don't really have an actual name for the game. Death 13K was just like the compo name I gave it. So I'm just going to stick with that for now until a better one comes to me. Oh, right. We're going to maybe do like asteroids or something like that. So um, what am I thinking? Let's try asteroids. It's a pretty simple, straightforward game. You have a little ship you can control. The ship can like turn in a circle. You can apply thrust to it and it'll glide in that direction. Um, we have to add asteroids. That's the whole point of the game. You basically play on a toroidal surface. So if your ship goes off the screen on the top, it comes up along the bottom at the same directional vector it's going. Um, your ship can its direction vector keeps moving even though you you could change the facing of the ship and you can shoot little bullets to blow up the asteroids um, you have big asteroids you can blow up into little asteroids and then you blow up the little asteroids for points and then occasionally the game spawns more asteroids and it's kind of like just to see how how big your score can get 
before you uh, lose your ship. So that's what we'll go for. Keep it simple. Keep it safe. Okay, stack project new is all set up. Let's go. We have our source app and all that directory. Everything we're kind of mostly familiar with somewhat. Um, let's set up a new Git repository there. Yes. And we'll stage all of those files. Set up the project. Boom. Okay, project set up. Well done. Um, okay, so then what do we need to do? We need to go into source. Our lib, uh, we'll, mm, we'll call this uh, game.hs. No. Kill it. No, I want asteroids game.hs. This will be our entry point module. All right, run, IO. Cool, we'll get that and um, get rid of lib, we don't really need it. Which means we need to update the app. It's kind of like the default template stuff that you gotta do for, if you just use the default template with stack. No biggie. Uh, we'll just import asteroids game and we'll call run. Okay, just make sure that we got that all set up right. We'll set up our build watcher. Uh, file watch. Or go. So this will just run in the background, continuously compiling our game as we make changes. Oh, no. Boo. Stack turned on this warning. I don't like it. I want to turn it off. <laughs> I, there is, there's a time to use export list. I've talked about this a lot of times on stream. I'm just not a huge fan of export lists and modules and Haskell in general. Um, you know, I, learning backpack has been on my bucket list for a while in Haskell. I don't know if it's still a thing and people do. But one of the things I did like a fair bit with OCaml was like the module system. I mean, modules are okay in Haskell. They're not the worst. They're fine. They are what they are. And export lists, there's a time and a place to use them. And I do use them, but you know, I just, I don't know. I don't like messing around with them. It's, it's fiddly busy work. It's not very fun. Um, okay. So I'm going to just load this into Asteroids. Anyways, I'm getting distracted here. To do, to do. Uh, that's good. That's good. Um, so we can run our game. The default exe it creates is Asteroids-exe for some reason. Maybe we could change that as well while we're here. And yeah, we'll call our, ast our executable Asteroids, lowercase. That seems nicer. Asteroids. There we go. Okay. Next thing we need is dependencies. So let's add SDL2. And I know I'm going to need linear. SDL2 uses that for things like vectors and stuff like that, which are going to be pretty important for our little project. Okay, so while that's compiling, let's go to main. So we don't want to just, uh, oh no, sorry, not this main, uh, the other, the main uh, module, game.hs. Yes, this one, excuse me, we'll import SDL2, or I think it's just SDL. Oh, 
I'll import SDL qualified. And import some specific things. Window config, so we don't have to like prefix all of the field names of the record. It's kind of annoying. While I'm here too, I'm going to set this variable Haskell process type. Uh, it does have an auto feature. I should probably use that more often. It sometimes works, sometimes, eh. I'm always bouncing around to different build tools with different projects, so. Um, yeah, what can you do? Stack GHCI. Okay, so we get that. You go do, um, first things we need to do is create uh, a window or initialize everything. I'm just going to initialize all. You can also like give flags to the SDL library to tell it like which modules you want to actually use. Are you going to use audio? Are you going to use video? Various other things. Um, just, we're just going to initialize all. If it becomes important, we can, we can change that, but we're going to make a full fledged game and use as much as we can here. Cause why not? Okay. Our window config. So we're going to set up our window configuration. It's going to be a window config. And it's going to be sdl.default window. And we'll set a few options on it. Let me pull up my docs. Default window, yep. Yeah. So we're going to set high DPI to true. Um, we'll set up a win. We'll set it up in windowed because it's just asteroids. I don't. I'm not going to make like a huge full screen 4K asteroids. <laughs> Uh, so 800 by 600 seems fine. Okay. Window high DPI. This is why we need to import the window config. Unqualified. And we'll set that to true. Uh, we want Windows Graphics Context. Or window Graphics Context. That's going to be an open GL context default. I think it's default open GL, something like that. And do do window position. I don't want it wherever. I think this should be centered or something like that. Yeah, centered. I think that'll, that'll be good. Yeah. Okay. We got our window config. We should be able to create our window console with uh, sdl.createWindow. Asteroids will be the name, window title and window config. And then we have to remember to, we have to do something else uh, and then destroy the window. Okay. And then we got to get a renderer. So SDL uh, create renderer for the window. Um, yeah, I think it's negative one uh, is a flag to it. And then a render config.
create renderer. What does this unknown C1 do? I forget. It'll be in the SDL documentation. Let's look there. No, not the SDL. API, there we go. Great render. Blah, I skipped it. Index. Okay, because you can have multiple renderers. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, different hardware renderers. So the flag just tells you, negative one just tells us to initial, tells the library to initialize the first one supporting the requested flags. So if we have an OpenGL context, we're going to try and get the first renderer that supports uh, OpenGL for us. And then we can get renderer flags. Okay, and does the Haskell library let us define what those are? Create renderer? No, uh, Word 32 of the flags, I assume. Oh, I don't want to be the source again. Mm, default. Oh, create window and render. <laughs> Good times. Good times. Do 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 do. Um, yeah. Renderer config. So the default renderer will create an accelerator renderer, which is what we want. Okay, so the default SDL, uh, default renderer. Okay, and then we have to destroy the renderer as well. This is all very procedural looking, isn't it? Typical, typical game loop setup, SDL setup code, right? Okay. So then program goes there in the hole, right? Draw the owl. Oh, we're going to need overloaded strings, of course. Okie doke. So uh, we need to do something here. Uh, let's... Let's just do the simplest thing we can possibly do. Uh, we'll display a black screen. Uh, render draw color. Uh, draw color, build color, color. Oh, what's the darn function? Draw points, draw rect, draw blah, 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 fill rects, yes, yes, yes. Okay, renderer draw color. Okay, that's what you call it. Renderer draw color. Okay. So we then give the renderer and we have to use this um, state stuff. I think it comes from SDL. Uh, 
And then we're going to need linear here. So we'll do 0, 0, 0, 255. So the first, that's just RGB and alpha. I'm going to go ahead and import control dot uh, concurrent. Uh, just for our thread delay. Uh, render clear, or sdl.clear. And sdl present. And then a uh, little thread delay for like a bunch of microseconds. Hopefully that's about three seconds. This is warning. Now let's do an export listing again. Okay, so that should be runnable. And we should get a window presents us the black screen. We're a little bit quick there. Let's add another zero there. Bow. Oh, gotta wait for it to build and link. Ha. There we go. Doesn't accept input yet, but there you go. All right, window, done. Okay, so we have the window done. Uh, the next step we need to do is to um, display a box. Or maybe we should do input, get input, so we can like quit the game. It's probably a good idea. How do we get input? Uh, basically, SDL lets you poll for events that happen inside the loop. So um, that's what you do. Um, how do we do it with the Haskell library? Not super sure. Prepare, getting started. There we go. All right, so we call we basically poll for events. Okay, simple enough. All right. Okay, so why don't we get rid of that um, thread delay stuff? Oh, we'll, we'll yeah. Let's get rid of the thread delay. We'll just get rid of it. And eventually, we're gonna have some kind of game loop. So the game loop will give the renderer okay. and so it'll be renderer sdl.renderer to io unit all right we'll have a function that takes the renderer at the end and renders stuff. And that'll have our clear code for now. Uh, renderer draw color and a v4 zero 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 two fifty five. About oh, basically this. Yeah, let me get rid of that. About pop that down here. All right, that's all it'll do. Nothing special right now. Um, but here we're gonna get events. All events. SDL dot. Okay, and then. Okay, that's an interesting way of uh, filtering the events. So we create like a little 
is the queue pressed a function, some event. And then we use any, which checks if this predicate is true for anything in the list or the foldable. And that should be good. Okay. I'll just take that. Uh, white space. Yeah. Fix all that. Yeah, that should be all lined up now. And then we just have to fix the names here. It is used, it's just I haven't used Q pressed yet. Okay, so then we basically check later on at some point, unless Q pressed, yeah, okay. So we call renderer and unless Q pressed, uh, that's gonna come from control.monad, then we loop again with the renderer. So import control.monad. This is where unless comes from. Okay, so now when I run this program, it should keep looping until I press the key button. Uh, I'm already there. Let's run a stack. So I'm not pressing anything. I can press Q on my keyboard. I should quit out. There we go. Let's try that again, just to make sure. Yeah, okay. So the window just didn't have, fo didn't have focus when I brought it up. Um, I think there might actually be a window option we can set. Um, that, the w that it should grab focus when it's initial when the window comes up. Do, 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 do. Window mode, input grabbed. No, uh, not, not, not necessarily the window um, with the mouse, not necessarily grabbing the mouse and restraining it to the window. Window visible, the default's true, yes, that is good. Sizable position, da 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 da, window mode. Yeah. Okay, so I just have to remember like when I'm futzing around here um, and starting the game to like actually grab focus and like make sure my focus is on that. And all that stuff, okay, so there you go. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's keyboard events. Okay, so what do we need to do now? Well, this, this loop isn't good enough for an arcade game. Uh, it's just, it's gonna run just as fast as it freaking can, uh, waiting and ch pulling for these, these input events and, and only returning. That's what this unless is doing uh, when Q is pressed. Otherwise we loop again. So it's, it's just gonna go as quickly as can. But in a game, we want like some kind of like game loop and the game loop has to uh, be able to run on different hardware platforms with the same-ish um, time. Like uh, the physics simulation should stay roughly this, in, like interpolate roughly the same on different target platforms. What I mean by that is that uh, your game loop shouldn't run faster on a fast computer and slower on a slow computer. Uh, there are ways to do the loop and set up the math so that your physics simulation can interpolate between like kind of a fixed-ish time step and be stable across platforms. So if like somebody's running a lower-end hardware, they'll still 
get maybe a degraded experience, but like funky things won't happen with your physics, with your game. There's lots of really, um, a lot of a lot of ways to structure these these things that um, that I don't know if we're gonna like go full bulletproof game loop here. Arcade physics, depending on how accurate you want it to be, don't need a huge amount of work. It'd be like super awesome, but we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do we're gonna do something. Um, so we're gonna set that up now. We're gonna we're basically gonna set like a a fixed time loop in Haskell and figure this out. So with that being said, um, how do we do that? Well, we need a bunch of variables and um, I'm gonna put them in the game in a game state. I'm gonna start bundling up some, or maybe it should be like engine state. Um, yeah. Or, or we just pass them through as, as parameters here without bundling them up. I don't know. No, no, let's, let's do it. Let's do it as a game state. So we're going to do, we're going to do an object here, a data structure, engine state. It's going to have uh, the, the render. I should have engine state. It's going to need the ticks. So we're going to keep track of the ticks are going to be like the totally elapsed time of our game as it's running. Um, so like a pretty big integer. And we're gonna need the time. And I believe SDL's time stuff it will return this as a double if I'm not mistaken. Um, they're used to in the older versions of SDL, like you'd have uh, this ticks function, which would get you like a 32 bit integer, I mean, word 32, uh, which would be the number of milliseconds. This is an iLibrary initialization. Um, that's all fine and dandy. It does technically wrap around at about like 40 some odd days or something if the game's running that long. For some reason, um, time is probably what you want to be using in modern SDL. And as a fairly more sophisticated implementation. <laughs> so we'll, we'll use that, but it, I think that returns like a fractional A, which we can just, I think we could just say like double. Uh, engine state. Um, so that's current time ticks. Uh, what else do we need? I think that's it. Maybe. Oh, accumulator. We need to accumulate. Um, yeah. Uh, also a double. Okay. So we're going to like step through one cycle of our loop, right? And we're going to try and like maintain some kind of fixed for frame rate, variable-ish frame rate, maybe, um, depending on the, on the hardware. Uh, but our Delta time in the, in the in the physics update, the physics integration, we want to keep it like within a certain threshold. And so if there's more time to use in a frame, uh, we should 
just update that. Um, I, I don't know if I can explain it as well as Gaffaround Games can in the famous article, Fix Your Time Step. This is a legendary article that kind of goes into, I think it's a legendary article anyway. I don't know if it's actually legendary. Um, so different stages of game loops. And these are all pretty good for like 2D games. Uh, 3D is a little bit different. But a lot of the same principles apply. Um, I don't know if we, we're going to go to this level. This is like power level 9,000. Uh, but we can we can try and get get to this one. This one's pretty easy. So yeah, we need the current time, the accumulator, right? So this is our main game loop, and this is like going to be our physics step here. So like that little integrating that fixed si slice of time into a, into our game state over time is how we're going to do that here. So we'll let, basically let the physics run as fast as it, as much as it can in a frame. Uh, then we render and loop again until the user presses the, that special key button. Yeah. So uh, how do we translate this into Haskell? This is another, another interesting skill to try and pick up as a Haskell programmer, I think, um, is like you see loops like this and a lot of people will get used to programming like this where you have you know, like a program counter and you use these statements to like control where the program counter goes and how it behaves throughout the lifetime of your program. Uh, and you think, and you look at Haskell and you're like, how do I even do this? Well, you we kind of already implemented this, this loop here with loop, right? We're explicitly passing in the renderer as a parameter to the loop function. Um, but it calls itself, right? This is like our while condition. Should we loop again, right? Our condition is if the Q key is pressed. Or, oh, sorry, if the Q key is not pressed, then loop again, right? So if don't, if not quit, loop again, right? Um, so, Basically, when you try, want to translate while loops into, into functional type stuff, you can recurse in Haskell pretty well, at least in, and I don't recommend doing this style of programming if you have like a, a language where you don't have, um, where the language isn't going to do, um, um, ch -ch 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 the the loop the, the recursion optimization um, that you that tail call tail call elimination all right if you don't have a language that's going to do tail call elimination for you you have to kind of either try and set that up yourself which is it's possible but not always straightforward maybe even a bit janky but in Haskell we can we can recur as long in in a tail call position and it'll this will actually un and ultimately compile into something like our while loop. So ch check your, your condition and then decide to loop again or not, basically. Loop or return. All right. And so when we return, we don't have to return a value or anything like that, we just return unit. Um, and the type of unless it returns unit. So that's why that works. Uh, you can even see that down here in the bottom of my screen. Take some Boolean there, some something in a monad unit returns a monad unit, right? So that's what loop returns a monad unit and returns a monad unit. This expression returns a whole monad unit. So that all hooks up, right? Pretty straightforward so far. Cool, cool. Um, so that that's cool. So then uh, we're basically going to translate that we're going to need to the other part we're gonna have to do is we're gonna do this again internally here. And we're gonna have to handle all of this uh, assignment stuff. So 
C and C-like languages have this wonderful property of being able to freely assign things um, and this assignment operator. So it's changing a location in memory over time of that. So that program counter is going through and it's checking the state of other variables in different places and, and dereferencing things and, and checking things on the stack and whatnot, doing all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, assignments changing this thing, right? And it changes over time. You don't, this equal doesn't mean that accumulator is equal to 0, 0.0. It means give this value 0, 0.0 to this, to the name of this thing on the stack, right? Or if this was like maybe a whole C file, it would be like some kind of global. Right? And so we can, we can change its value over time with this whole thing. Haskell's immutable. It's a functional programming language. We don't necessarily have this luxury, but it doesn't mean we can't buy it back um, with some tricky trickiness. Um, I don't know if we'll get into that. Maybe we will, because this is actually kind of kind of nice in some situations to have um, the ability to express um, this change over the state of the game engine. So like changing the state of the accumulator and things like that. Um, this, I, I find this is actually kind of a nice syntax for doing that. Um, it's just, I don't like it in the C-ish context because like it introduces its own, well, it's fine in C, it's it's a thing. It, it, it's a thing, it's its own thing. It's kind, it can be kind of nice in Haskell, but it can also be kind of not in vanilla, boring, plain Haskell without any helper stuff, which we're, we're going to do right now. So how do you translate this into Haskell is, is the next step, right? Like how, if you see an article like this, like how do I translate current time and like setting a new value for current time with the assignment operator? Right. Hold your horses. It's not going to be pretty for a bit. <laughs> we'll try and compress it back down later though. Um, so essentially, we're going to have to uh, create some kind of default value for our engine state, some kind of setup, uh, init engine state, where we give the, the values for these things. All right, that's kind of what this punk this is all doing up here. It's kind of initializing the state of the program, uh, the, the, the ticks. Um, this is a constant, we should have that too. Um, the delta, the kind of the size of the slices we want. The current time and, and accumulator. All right, so we're gonna put all that here, all right, in this explicit function that's gonna construct it for us. Um, and actually, I'm gonna make this happen in IO of engine state, uh, just so that we can initialize the current time to this uses an IO an IO action here. Right, getting the time from the system, the computer is is a side effect, side affecting action that happens. All right, when you call this at different times, you're going to get different values. So we're going to have to do that when we construct our state. We're going to have to do that in IO as well. Uh, I'm just going to use uh, engine state. I'm going to use my little happy little um, applicative functor style initialization thing here. Uh, actually, we need to pass in the renderer here. We can't get it from somewhere, so let's do that. So this will be pure renderer. Our next value will be ticks. That'll be pure 0, 0.0, right? Just like that. And we need to initialize the current time. So what, this is where we need the IO action, why we need this kind of functory applicative pattern. Uh, so we're just gonna run uh, sdl.time. And then we're gonna set the accumulator's initial value as well. Oh, oh, uh, pure renderer. Oh, that's what it meant. 
one, zero, six, six, six. Did I want that? No, I want that to be a double. Yeah. Oops. All right. Cool, Copazetti, we're all good so far. You're with me, not so bad, not so bad. Now, um, so this is like our engine state, all right? So we're being, we're being explicit about what values are there in our state. <clears throat> They're not just freely hanging around as uh, symbols that we can mutate with assignment or variables that we can mutate in some other scope with assignment, right? We gotta handle these things. Um, the constant though, delta, we should probably put in here somewhere, um, maybe above engine state. And that'll be a double as well. We don't need a cost keyword here, obviously, because this equal sign in Haskell, right, doesn't mean assignment. It doesn't change over time. So it's literally a constant. All basic stuff. I know if I'm going into too much detail, let me know. Chat. All right. But if you want me to keep going and hear more, I'd be happy to do that as well. Okay. All right, so even even sets it up here too a little bit. Kind of nice, previous, current, whatever state is. That's gonna be our game, our engine state or game state, engine state, whatever. It could be game state. Maybe we'll rename it game state. Near, 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 near. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. So once we have the initial game state, then we can pass it in, we can uh, require it in our loop. Uh, we're gonna ignore it here for now. Uh, we just gotta pass it in. We gotta initialize it first. So we'll just do that. We'll bind it uh, in it game state renderer. Uh, actually, we don't need the renderer to pass in as an explicit here anymore because it's contained in the game state. So let's get rid of that. And we call a loop state. Oh, and I called it in engine state. My bad. Okay, there we go. So of course we don't have references to render renderer anymore. We need those, so we should pull those back into scope. We can do that like this. Engine state renderer. Or I could just use record wildcards, bring that in. Easier. Pop, pop, pop. Record wildcards, thank you. This lets us, um, well, I can state at in case I need it. Use that syntax, and then we don't have to like use the function application on state. It'll just be a bound for us, handy dandy. Yeah, so like an extra binding, we can just replace renderer game state renderer. Sorry, engine state right here. Ugh. Let's get rid of the engine. No, 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 I'll do all that. Sorry, sorry, my bad. Hmm. Okay. 
game date renderer is what I want to have. Okay, sorry, let's do it like that. Prepare. And so we no longer pass that here, we pass state. Okay, that should fix that. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right. So. Now, we need to actually change the state. This is where, where things can get a little, hmm, yuck. So again, we're gonna need to translate this, uh, this loop here. Um, so we're gonna do this one. Now we're gonna update some variables in the state. Right, and then we're gonna do a new loop to do the physics updates update the simulation, that sort of stuff, right? And then you gotta render the state. So this is gonna be done in two parts. All right, so we let, uh, we get the new time. And we're gonna bind that to sdl.time and frame time going to be equal to new time minus the game state current time. All right, so this is the total amount of time that has elapsed uh, between frames. And Basically, we're going to set the current time as the new time and, and accumulate some frame time in the accumulator. And this loop is basically going to decrement the accumulator, updating, accumulating a little slice of time each time we go through the loop, um, integrating, updating the physics state. So we get that stable update in our simulation where the difference in time is fixed. Semi-fixed, well, mostly fixed. All right, so um, I don't know. Um, yeah, so one, one way we can do this, the kind of somewhat ugly way we could do this, we could do like the first state trend update we want to do, right? Where we um, set the uh, game state current time to be the new time. Equals uh, new time. And the game state accumulator, we initialize that to the game state accumulator plus um, frame time. And basically then we're going to have um, state prime prime bound to like some update function that's going to do all of this. It's going to update our state, right? So we got to give that state prime. So that's gonna take the game state, ba -ba -da, return a new game state, or new IO game state. It doesn't necessarily have to do IO, I don't think. A lot of these physics calculations and updates should be pure. Um, so actually, we might not need to bind it like this. We could potentially do it like this, maybe. Okay, update the state where the current time is going to be the new time and the accumulator is going to be initialized 
to whatever the accumulator was plus the current frame time. And so this is doesn't need to be I.O. This could be game state to game state. And so uh, now we just need to make this loop. OK, so how do we translate this inner loop here? All right, we can do the same thing we did with the outer loop, right? We can use unless for our condition here at the end, and then loop again. So unless this is true, call ourselves again. Right, with some with some accumulated um, state. So unless the game uh, state uh, accumulator uh, is greater than or equal to delta time, right? Then we update with a new game state. Now we could, how do I want to write this game state like this? Mm. I don't know, I'm gonna put a hole there for a second. All right, so we need to fi figure out the next state of our variables um, to get our loop going. All right, so we need to update accumulator and t, right? We're going to decrement accumulator by the slice size, delta t. We increment the amount of accumulated ticks by, by the delta size. Um, so we could like call it a game state prime, call it like state prime or state. Yeah. Maybe we maybe we'll bind it like this. Do that. Next state. State, right? Where game state uh, accumulator equals game state accumulator minus uh, dt or delta and game state ticks equals game state ticks plus dt. And then we could put next state here, update next state. All right, we can't quite use unless here. Um, because that would, that returns a monad. Um, this, we're not in a monadic context here. Um, so what we could do instead is just an if, well, in, if the game state is this, then just return the state, and then we'll turn that into else. Uh, that's not delta, that should be delta. Uh, and that should be delta as well. And accumulate four. And then uh, we loop with state prime. Now that's it. Okay, so 
if we run this, this will run until we press Q again, I believe. But how do we know this is like kind of actually somewhat working? Well, if our loop, if our update loop isn't working uh, and gets stuck into an infinite loop, we'll never get to the render stage. So we'll know it's, yeah, we'll know it's, it, we'll know it's working if it actually clears the screen and paints black and we can escape by pressing Q. All right, so we got a black screen, press Q, it quits, we're good. As well, as long as our equations are correct and, and we're right about this, this loop, but we are, okay. Okay, so now we have an update loop, roughly speaking. Uh, we're still missing a little bit from here. We still have like this integrate function, which changes the state, does actually like a lot of the game logic. Um, this is mostly just engine bookkeeping details, not really important to um, the state of the game and then, and then rendering things. So now that we have this game loop, we should be able to um, draw something. Let's draw a rectangle. That'll be like the ship in our asteroid game. Now that all this bookkeeping is done, right? So actually I'm gonna take a moment to um, commit some of this stuff. Add game loop. Okay. This is like our mostly okay-ish game loop. And we could take it like like Gaffer says to the final touch. Um, we might still want to actually do that. This just accumulate. This loop is simple enough. It accumulates. There's some amount of the time that may not be used in a frame. In this this thing, um, it's passed over, like it says in the GitHub blog post, by the the accumulator variable, which is why we're adding in last state accumulator and adding in the um the current the current frame time that we're going to use well before we go into this inner loop um and so the next step just allows you to use up more of that or interpolate what's left over between what's left over um which is this kind of like funky looking stuff um, so we might get to that in a later, later step. I don't know if it's going to matter too much for asteroids though. So, um, we'll see. Okie dokie 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 dokie. Uh, so let's add some data for the ship. How do we want to mm, put our data? We could just put it right in here. Um, game state. World. Like we're not really going to care about all of these variables. We're just going to care about the, not even the renderer, even. Not like only the. We actually probably don't even need to pass in the render into the game state. I don't know why we're doing that. But um, I'll leave it for there, there for now. I'm just gonna put it at the top level for now. I'll put this as a V2, um, it's gonna be a C int. Just cause for some reason, the Haskell SDL two wrapper library, um, still uses like foreign types for some of the things that SDL uses um, and doesn't like marshal them to Haskell, probably for performance reasons, I'd imagine. So um, that's where that comes from. And that comes from foreign.c.types. Yeah. Uh, 
Hopefully that won't be too annoying. But we'll have to add it to our initial state here. So we'll go pure um, v2, and we'll start at like, I don't know, 2020, say. And that's fine, okay. So we got some position data for the player ship. Now let's render something. Let's render that. So the renderer that gets passed down here, uh, we have, we clear the screen. We should now be able to um, SDL render draw color. Renderer. Let's, I don't know, use red. Let's make it really stand out. 255. And then we need to call fill rect. On the renderer, we need to give it a rect. Um, a rectangle. So we need the game state. So our render function now. Which is probably why we wanted to have the renderer in there. And these ones. Okay, so let's do that rect. We'll just do, we'll just draw the ship as a rectangle for now. Like we're, we're just trying to get a rectangle on the screen here. So uh, rectangle, rectangle, um, where we draw a rectangle. Do, 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 do. Renderer, I believe it's fill rect. Yeah. Okay, so it takes the render a maybe rectangle C and okay, so that's a little bit more information. So this will be adjusts. Just shipwrecked. And we need to create a rectangle. Okay, we have a constructor. Rectangle. Can we just, what's the point? Can we just P? Okay. It's P type to type. Handy wrapper to help us create points of vector level. Well, we can just give it our V2. It's like P game state player ship. V2 and then the width, right? What's wrong with this? Oh, SDL dot. Okay. Type checks, compiles, runs. We should get a red rectangle. Sweet. Okay. We're getting somewhere now. All right, let's make that rectangle move. So we need to go to our update section here and change the position of the player ship over time by changing next state. Uh, 
Game state player ship. Oh, can I add V2s together? Probably, hopefully. Num, 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 num. Yeah, num. Okay. Uh, oh, wait. So it's a. Equal them, order them, show them, traverse them, functor them, mona them. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, there we go. Num. Okay, so we should have plus on it. We'll take another V2 on this side, and we'll just add one on the X axis. And we'll just make it go across the screen like that. And this should be fairly smooth. I'm kind of slow, probably. Okay. But it's not changing. Did I run it before recompiling, maybe? Or is moving so slowly? No, I don't think it is. Okay. Um, hmm, what's what's doing then? I know what it is. <laughs> uh, we introduced a bug when we switched from unless to if. I think we just need to flip that sign around. Nope. Nope. I was wrong. See, we're getting we're getting into an infinite loop here. I was wrong about that. Control C out of that, fix that. Let's see. Did we Yeah, we accumulate. We subtract delta from the accumulator. Add delta to the game ticks. All right, we're updating next state from the old state. Uh, let's see, uh, we could do. Mm -hmm. Let's just, well, this is an IO here. Why don't we just um, do a quick little dirty poster len here of the um, player ship. We should see th this value changing over time. It's staying at 2020 though. Okay. Ah, okay. Next state. We always have to return the next state. <laughs> That's what we were doing. There it goes. Okay. Cool, we press Q and that all works. So we can take that little print statement out. Okay. All right, and so like our fixed time step here now, and it just basically means that 
if I'm running this on a slower computer or a faster computer, we should see roughly the, the change um, be somewhat consistent, be pretty much consistent. Hey, Sage Dev, welcome to the stream. We are making an Asteroids clone using the Haskell programming language, which is what I usually stream on this channel, um, just to kind of get my feet wet with what it would be like to actually make a real full-on game with, with Haskell, see if it's worthwhile. Uh, and to gain some experience and learn and figure these libraries out and stuff. What's happening with you? You a Haskell dev, game dev, a bit of both, just chilling. Okay, so we can change the X over time, which is great. Um, but for like an asteroid ship, we're gonna want like uh, propulsion, it's so like some sort of velocity, we're going to want a velocity vector, not just our current position. Um, we're going to be able to like turn the ship, so we're going to have to apply some kind of rotation vector to it, or some type of rotation matrix to the vector to, to turn it. Uh, all these sorts of things. So let's get the ship moving. See how, much, see how far we can get with this, though. Um, because... My stream time is running out for tonight. Got a bit of time left though. Um, so why don't we take a pause here to commit this. Pretty decent chunk of change. So when applied, this change will render a moving box. So you're a full stack dev. Started off in the front end, worked a couple of years, closure, nice. Fell in love with FP, good stuff. We love FP here. No Haskell experience, but interested to see what it's like. And that's what this stream's all about, friend. You come to the right place, so welcome. Yeah, my primary, my primary motivation for doing this stream, which I do once a week, um, is to show what it's like to work on a Haskell project. And in a way that's like not just like a tutorial introduction to Haskell, like let's build real stuff and make things work and figure it out. So hope you enjoy. Um, if you have any questions, feel free of course to stop me and um, put them up there because I, I love explaining stuff and I'm happy to. Okay, so when we're doing an update, we're thinking about the before state and the after state and how we want the thing to change. Um, so we, what do we wanna do first? Let's get, should we get turning working first or propulsion going first? I think maybe turning maybe. Although I don't know how to use this SDL rendering library to rotate things, actually. Can you rotate cubes or boxes? So Vec is just some basic stuff. We don't need that. Uh, renderer. Let's just do a quick little search. If there's like anything rotatey, rotate, turn, no, probably not. Okay, um, hmm. That means we're probably gonna have to use the SDL rendering API to draw our ship as a series of lines, like a triangle instead of a box. I don't think it has any transformation functions. Anything in like that in the uh, SDL API. All right, render, 
transform, rotate. Oh, well, textures can be rotated. Apparently. I mean, if we have to like track all the points for the triangle and do the rotation ourselves, then the math is fine. It's not that hard. Okay, so why don't we try? I mean, ultimately, asteroids, right? You gotta have a triangle anyway, so why don't we try that? All right, so the, the player's position right, it should still be a C2 int, but we need like a more complicated function for rendering the ship. Um, we're also going to need... The position isn't going to tell us about the rotation of the ship. All right. Um, we should be able to store that rotation as a... 2D vector. All right, and then we just need the unit of that vector to say like where on the circle it is, you know, get the, do the radian calculation to figure out where it is, or um, yeah, or we need to do, yeah, get the rotation and figure out the rotation matrix to rotate all the points in the triangle that we want to render. Fun times. So basically, we're going to need a rotation, uh, rotation, some rotation data. Rot. I'm just going to call it rot. Nah, I'll just call it rotation. V2 of C int. Yeah, and then we're going to need to initialize that when we create our initial game states. There's going to be a unit vector. So a unit vector is like a point on the plane, right? And you want to know, like a vector can rep represent like a, a magnitude, like a a spot that points to a place and like how far it goes, but the unit one constrains it to just between zero and one. And the idea is that you, you just inside the unit circle, you just want like the, it helps you get the rotation of something on a 2D plane, basically. Terrible math teacher, I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, so we add it there, we initialize it, and what do we want to do next when we change it? Ooh. Before we do that, let's let's render the triangle itself. <laughs> I think we should. Yeah, yeah, let's, let's go that way. So uh, we'll keep this. We'll not update the player game ship for now. We'll, we'll remove that for now. Uh, we're going to change our render function for the ship. It's all of that code. Render player ship. Uh, in order to render a player ship, we need a ren uh, we need the game state player position, the game state player rotation, and the render to draw it on. Which will be not renderer, game state renderer.
Uh, oh, did I not call it player position? What did I call it? Oh, silly me. Player ship. Okay, I'm going to call it player position. Makes more sense. I really should make a macro for that. Okay. Render player ship. All right, it's going to take a vector to cint v2 cint and it's going to re and a renderer sdl renderer and returns some io action it's going to render it to the screen all right it's a side effect drawing to to the screen buffer So IO unit, I'm not going to return anything by doing this. Okay, so this is where we can start like doing fancy, fun, pure Haskell math functions. Right, we got the position, pause, and the rotation. I'm going to write it out in full. Okay, I don't know exactly what's going to go in there yet. All right, but from this, we want to draw a triangle. In order to draw a triangle, we're going to need three points and a way to draw lines between them. We have render draw points. Um, and draw lines. Right. So draw lines is probably what we more like what we want, like an array of of points. And so without do without worrying about any of the rotation stuff yet, that I was kind of harping on, I was getting a bit ahead of myself. Let's figure out what points we need in order to draw a triangle around the player position, and we'll try and keep the point in the middle of the, the ship. And then hopefully that'll make the rotation stuff a little bit more straightforward um, and, and kind of do what the user would expect. Like we want to rotate around that point, so we'll draw the triangle around it. This is generally how Asteroids works. And so when we give these points to draw lines, do we have to, we have to give it the starting as well in order for it to draw a closed shape. It's not gonna auto close for us. Okay, so we have to give all of the points, looks like, and think of it statefully, I guess. All right, well, uh, Let's take a stab at it, guessing some numbers and seeing what we can come up with. Oh wait, I already have the documentation pulled up. Uh, draw lines. Okay, so it takes a vector of C point, uh, V2 C ints. Um, Storable vectors. Okay, so we're gonna need the vector library. That's probably already a hidden dependency, so this will be pretty quick. Do -do 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 -do. Let me keep my little hole there so it keeps compiling. Uh, import. I think it's data dot vector. Uh, just import the type. And then import qualified uh, data dot vector as v in case we need any vector functions. Should probably move that down there and move that down there. OK, 
Okay, cool. Um, so we're back to here. So f draw lines. Renderer. And um, the vector as a v dot from list uh, probably won't. Well, we'll just use this for now as for like testing to make sure we can do like some points. What's the problem with this? Oh, it's not the right kind of vector. Uh, you want storable vectors. Okay. Where do I get those? Data dot vector dot storable. Okay. Probably because they want to be serializable, and so you can pass them over to C directly. That makes sense. Let's change that to storable. I think that should maybe it'll be like that. Cool. It will be like that. Okay. So let's imagine from, I'm gonna start my point in the middle and I'm just gonna draw the position, the triangle as if it was facing the top of the screen. Um, so half half the height we want of the, the triangle, I guess will be, all right, so we want our height to be like, say 20, it'll be like 10. Um, so we got to put V2 points of V2 scenes. Okay, so that'll be like a P. Um, our V2 position plus P, the dollar assigns the applied to. So like the P is a function, a constructor. Position is a vector, a v2 of c int. We're going to add another vector to it. Um, that's going to not change the x, but we're going to add to the y um, negative 10. We want it to go, this, this to be the top point. All right, what's the problem with this? Oh, it's sdl.p, it's not in scope. Okay, and the problem with this is redundant bracket, okay. Cool, cool, helpful. Uh, we're gonna ignore rotation for now, so let's underscore that, okay. Uh, let's try another point. I'm not gonna get this like off the top of my head. Um, but it's going to be something in the realm of position. So let me move this over here so we can s keep seeing this. Like this. Okay. Next one. Uh, let's do like just go around the circle, I guess. I'm sure there's a formula for this. I could probably look it up. <laughs> um, the x this time, let's let's add 10 to it. So it'll be 10 over from the center and then 10 down from y. Oops. Get rid of this. And that. And then we go another p. Position, V2, um, so the left now, 10, uh, still 10 on the Y. And then I guess we got to put the final position, like if we're imagining this as a mouse going around from point to point to point. So let's just copy and paste that over there. Um, I'm 
Okay, so that, that computed, uh, that compiled. So let's see if we actually drew what we drew. Nothing, because uh, we just set a draw color, right? Yeah. Uh, renderer, draw color, uh, renderer. Let's, let's set the color to green this time. Why not? R, G, 255, V, zero. So we need to do, What's, uh, what did I do here? Burp, burp, burp. Hmm. Um, not expecting this type error. This is kind of weird. Uh, what did I do? Not enough arguments to v4. No, it should be. Oh, v4. Yeah, no, v4 is right. One, two, three, four. That's that's good. So it's it's parsing this a bit weird because why is it? Why? I don't understand what I did wrong here. What's going on? I was not expecting this. Renderer. Did I type renderer wrong, maybe? No, it's kind of not. Okay. Maybe it's... Oh, it's this. Okay, that's what it is. Okay, so... That sucks. That was not a good type error. Um, that's a... An, the reason why it looked funky to me was because um, when you use do syntax, you're like going into like a it's kind of like a Python mode sort of type thing. It's it's I'm not going to like explain monads or anything, but um, it's indentation oriented is what I'm getting at, getting at here. So each you can think to simplify things. You can think of each line has to be like one I/O returning action or function, right? Something that returns I/O on each line in the do, and it kind of, and then you can do another one on this line, another one on the next line, and so on and so forth. Um, the final line has to be like your I/O return type or whatever, and it was giving me this funky type error um, when I did this, uh, but the type error kind of, is kind of like weird looking. Like no instance for control.monad.io.class.monad.io, arrow, vector, what? This looks like line noise. What does this even mean? Right? And the error is even being reported on this line way up here. Um, because it's basically it's getting confused about the the parse of the do block here, right? This is a perfectly cromulent I/O action. So when I was looking at the line up here and why this error is here, I'm like, this isn't right. Something's not parsing right. Um, is kind of the intuition I've built in my head around it, I guess. So generally, you haven't indented something right, or you haven't applied enough arguments to something on a line, and you get these kind of like odd looking type errors on a weird line in a do block. And that's kind of my trigger for, I guess, noticing those. I don't know if it always works, but it's a pretty good heuristic, I think. It hasn't failed me for the most part. So I don't need to import the vector type just yet. Let's get rid of that. Okay, so that compiles a build. Let's run it, see what happens. Okay, we get a triangle. Bueno. Um, I'd want to do one quick little test and see if we actually need this final position. Or if it'll automatically like close the loop for us. It won't. Okay, cool. Good to know. Good to know.
Okay. All right. Now, 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 now. Now what do we need to do? We need to... We need to be able to get the ship, the points that we need to render the ship and translate them based on the player's rotation. And then we should be able to change the rotation vector and then see the triangle turn. All right, so this list shouldn't be hard-coded. Let's make it a function. All right, that's gonna take a, basically these two, well, this parameter. And return a list of, or maybe a vector, this is where we need the type now, a vector of uh, SDLP. Of, do I have to tell SDLP what it is? Yeah, a, a, a point, sorry, an SDL point V2 C int. Uh, so I'm just going to copy and cut that out. Uh, da, da, da. And no, 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 it's gonna be like this. Uh, it could be a little not fancy, but I like to be consistent. So I'm gonna do it like this. I gotta give some kind of. I guess it compiles maybe with an error, but it still compiles. Okay. So this handy dandy little type error is I just don't have that vector type in scope anymore because I just removed it. I'm gonna bring that back. Storable vector. What's up? There we go. Okay, so now I gotta fill in that hole. Well, we know what goes in there. We can just copy and paste this. We had before. I just got to bring the position name and scope. And boom. Reasoning by substitution. It's super easy. All right, so we pulled out that, that, that piece of code into a function. Um, now we can get that list of ints. We could even change the ship size if we wanted to um, by not hard coding this 10 value in here. That could be a thing. I think we're gonna have to keep it a cint just so that all the numeric additions uh, use the same types. Yeah, or so the V2s use all the same types, yeah. So if we want to pass that down, then we also need to pass it in here. C int, and maybe pass it after the rotation, position size, rotation. See int here. Oh, I'm not being consistent. <laughs> Flip that around. Position. Size. And then wherever we use 10 here. Oh. 
hold in size. And then we just have to give the position game state player size as well. It's getting a little far over the right, so pull it to the left. And we have to update our initialization code. So we have this error here. So remind us to do that, which is handy. And this will be 10. And that could be very fun to see. Um, so we want to like change it over time. Player size equals game state. Player size plus one. Ah, oh, growing triangle. Uh, uh, cute, cute. There we go. And yeah, there you go. So there's the player triangle. Super duper. Okay. How do we rotate all of these these points around in the middle with the rotation that rotation vector so that we can get the right orientation to render the ship in? Okay. Um, so we're going to need some kind of transformation thing uh, for all of these points. Hmm. So let's pull them out. And bind them with let. Let the ship points be the player ship points. Grab this. And we're going to map some function over them. Uh, compose that dot, there you go. Okay, so now we should have a whole Oh, right. Um, this isn't quite working because... So this type error here um, is... So if we look at what the type of ship... It expected a vector of those SDL points here in the argument to draw SDL.draw lines. Right? But it's saying we're getting a list of something. And we're getting a list of something because up here, let ship points, I'm using the map function, which is specifically typed to return lists. You can see the the type of map and the status line below there. Um, so we want to be able to map over the, the vector that's returned by player ship points. Uh, I think we should be able to, if, if it implements as a functor, that map would be able to go inside there, but it doesn't implement functor. Okay. And so that's what this type instance here. So functors kind of let you map over containers, like inject a high level function. Um, to change the contents of that particular container. Kind of. Basically, that's the idea. Um, the more strict definition of, like, what a functor is is a bit more elegant than that, but that's as far as I'm going to go with that explanation. Um, so, usually I reach for, like, functor. It's, like, one of the most common interfaces to use for a type in Haskell. It's everywhere, and I use it quite frequently. 
um, but storable vectors don't implement it. So um, we can fire up our REPL if we want to. It's not going to compile because we still have the hole there, but I can import um, uh data dot vector dot storable vector the type i can ask what types of instances does it have right so you can it has the equality type class so you can tell if two vectors are the same we've got monoid uh, ord semigroup show read okay so we don't have functor uh, maybe vector gives us its own like special map implementation Your length, null, indexing, extracting sub vectors, construction, we can initialize, monadically, we can unfold, enumeration, we can enumerate the values of it, concatenate it, modifying. Okay, so, yeah. Oh, there we go, mapping. So it implements its own version of map. It's probably not able to maintain the, the functor laws, so we can't have, like, fmap, which is fine. Sometimes common with specialized data structures. So, like, functors have laws, which is why uh, implementing it is awesome when you can because then it lets users of your your data type kind of use it with other haskell -y things uh seamlessly and it works the way they expect it because those laws are in place um, but not every data structure can implement the functor laws so that's when you get that so we have to do v dot map yeah Now, our type error is just the hole. Okay, which is good. We like holes. All right, so it's going to tell us what's in scope around that hole. Ship points, renderer, size, position, player ship. Sometimes valid hole works if there's enough type information around it that it can tell you functions you could put in there. Uh, these aren't the ones we want. Right, we want some transformation function that's going to take a point, a rotation vector, and is going to rotate that point. That, well, we need an origin vector to rotate around, don't we? Yeah. I think that's how that works, right? So we're going to have the origin point. We're going to have the, the input point, right? that we want to rotate around, and we're going to have a vector from the origin point to the unit circle. That's going to say, like, the rotation. I wish I had my graphics palette, but I don't right now to draw this out for you. Um, uh, maybe I can do it with my mouse. Um, Is it starting? There we go. Okay. All right. So we're going to need our origin point. All right. Our point to translate, say, the top of our triangle. All right. And then we're going to need to, depending on the player's rotation, say it's here, translate the position of this point so that it is facing. It is in front of that the end of that vector, basically. Same with all the other points. You like, have to translate them around. Okay, so we want to move this here so that in the next state it becomes... Doo -doo 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 -doo. 
There. All right. And then we do it for the whole the whole set of them so that this one over here is like kind of down here. We'll get rotated by the same amount. All right, and end up over here. And the one that was over here, we get rotated the same amount. And it'll end up somewhere over there. And then we draw a triangle and it'll be rotated. Cool. So wonderful programmer art. You're welcome. <laughs> How are we doing for time? We're a little over over stream time. Um so we'll have to we'll have to finish this up another day, but we'll just fill this in a little bit here with our uh transform uh origin, maybe I'll call it. And we'll give it the origin point, uh, which will be position, uh the rotation. And it'll get as input the input point we want to rotate around the origin. So we just have to get, bring rotation in scope, size, rotation. And then we just have to define transform origin. And if our implementation of transform origin works, then it should rotate that point and be good to go. So this will be a v2c int to v2c int with a point, sdl.point, v2c int, and we'll return an sdl.point v2c int. Okay. Origin, uh, rotation, uh, point. We'll pull out the vector from that. Right, and so we put a hole here. Da -da -da. Da -da. Oh, I don't have that here for destructuring. Is it just field up P? Yeah, okay. Okay, so now around my hole, I have all of my things that I brought in scope, right? I have to return a point. So I already know what I have to return. It's going to be an sdl.point. And then a hole. Oh, sdl.p, sorry. It's going to be the constructor function there. All right, so now I need a, a v2 c end. Cool. Um, so I haven't used I, any of my points yet, so i got to figure out the, the math of that. Uh, I believe it should just be a vector multiplication. Uh, rotate point uh, around origin. This is roughly what we want, right? So theta is the angle of rotation. <laughs> this is all in degrees. Not quite. Burp, 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 burp. 
well, I am I am running a bit over time, but basically you can stack overflow this stuff or math overflow this stuff, figure out what it is, um, and and do that. So we'll we'll get to it next week. We'll start rotating that. So I will leave it there. And mm, we can't really commit it because it's not quite finished. Uh, yeah, that's that's the general gist of it. So you, you move the point to the thing, to the center, to the origin, rotate the new point, and then translate it back out along the, the direction. Yeah, that's pretty straightforward. Okay, we can probably do this. Okay, so... Well... We already have the origins. We just want to create a new point at the origin. Right? No, because then we wouldn't be using point. Right. These are the, these will be the, the components of our vector. Oh, it's calculating the angles of float. Uh, so we can convert that to radians easily enough, I guess. That's, that's basically good. Okay. So, we'll have to let bind a bunch of things in uh, sdl.p something. We'll take, so we'll have to calculate rotation to the unit vector, which will give us a double. And then we can take the sign of that. And cosine C, unit uh, rotation as well. Or I guess I can bind that since I'm repeating it. Get rid of those, dollar sign there. How do you calculate that? Oh, linear dot unit. Oh, it's already defined for us because we have the linear library. Dur. Okay, so why is linear dot linear dot unit? Pascal linear unit. Linear dot vector. Oh, sorry, not quite the word. Okay. 
Yeah. Right. I have to, we have to calculate the angle from the rotation in some unit. Da -da -da -da. Supposing we get that sin cosine should work. Then we go to our overflow. We create a new P back to the origin. SDL dot P, which would be a V2 of basically position minus the, uh, so it'll be position origin I'm getting stream brain now. I gotta finish this. Uh, yeah, so position, the input position, right? Uh, minus the origin. Yeah. So point minus origin. That's translated back. Then we rotate it by multiplying with our sine and cosine the different components. All right, so x will be px times cosine minus p dot y times cosine, not sine. How do I get the different components out of a, the vector? Do it like that. And the Y part will become PX times sine plus PY times cosine. And then okay, the the subtraction instance doesn't like me doing this with uh, V2s, so we'll we'll figure that out in a second. Um, or no, it's oh, it's because I changed point. Yeah, points no longer. Yeah. That makes more sense. Okay. Uh, what is sine and cosine don't like me? Uh, floating. The int. Mm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. This is going to be type numerics and gymnastics a bit. Because we got to convert these all back to, to C units ultimately at the end of the day. Haskell's just not letting us coerce things all willy nilly, which is good. It's what you want. Okay, so we get the x, y, that should be good. We'll figure out the rest in a minute. Uh, we translate the point back along our rotation vector, basically. So we get a new v2, where the x component's going to be um, the new x plus our origin x.
Oh, I guess P, no, P is in the original. Is it CX? Yeah, the, subtract the pivot point CX, then rotate it. Counterclockwise, then add the point again. Uh, we got this somewhat messed up, but yeah, generally in the right area. So uh, X new plus CX. Y plus point Y. Okay, this is all not good. So X is going to be our next, our translated X, our rotated X. Um, so the original formula given here, CX and CY are the input points, and I think point P is like the origin point. Oh, CX is the pivot point. Yeah, so that is the origin. Okay, so we're, we're not bad. We're not far off. Pivot point. Origin. Yeah, uh, all over the place here. Okay. Digga digga digga. Get back to our code. Where did my code go? Uh, I closed it, didn't I? It's happening, folks. It's happening. We're almost there, though. Game. Okay, so the type gymnastics we're going to have to go through here to get back to C. Well, first we have to get the rotation angles, radians, whatever you want to use from uh, the rotation vector. They're just using a float here, which makes me think they're converting to degrees. All right, so we had a function called angle that did this. Uh, oh, sin, sin, what is the type of sin, what does sin want? What's well, some kind of floating num type number? That double, double was that. If I change the type to this, floating A to A, will that make it happy? No, GHC says no, still wrong. Oh, because uh, I named the binding the same name as the function. Awesome. Very smart of me. So let's rename it something smarter. Like um, two angle. Yes, that's fine. I uh, hotkeyed around a bunch of weird places. Here we go. Bam. Two angle. 
two angle. Okay. Okay, so we still have like the floating C in problem. So we need to combine the sin with something that's going to convert us back to C int. Or we leave that sine and cosine calculation there. We convert point X and point Y into our um, floats and we truncate at the end. So Haskell, can we, I think we can have from integral, I think maybe. From integral. From integral, does that work? Okay, yeah, that makes us happy. Okay, and then in our output uh, point here, this hole we should be able to use. Uh, we have to convert back to C int from our loading point numbers because X and Y are now doubles. Um, that's I'm gonna get upset with us because we got to go back to integral. We got to truncate. Um, something with x, something with y plus point y. What's that function? Uh, floor, ceiling, round, or just truncate. Mm, round. I don't know how accurate, I wonder how accurate it'll be. Probably good enough for our purposes. So will that, that should fit. some name shadowing errors and stylistic things. We haven't implemented two angle yet, but assuming we can, um, hopefully once this all types checks, we should, and we'll just clean up this code. Uh, redundant braces, okay. Don't really use point. Oh, I do use point, so I'm just gonna rename it like P internally here. Okay, so we're getting we're getting caught a little bit here, which is probably a good thing, maybe. 
Probably good there. You couldn't match the expression V2C int to actual type. Oh, I, because I used P already. Ugh. Um. Oh, I gotta use a different name. Marmar. Okay, I'm gonna call it P. I'll we'll call this P prime. And we don't use P prime. Ah, oh, stupid mutation. Okay, yeah. So P prime here is the translated to origin point. And X and Y components here, the X new, new Y components from that. So it's mutating this input point here. Okay. Gotcha. So P, we're assigning it to a new variable P prime here. Um, oh God, I'm just getting too tired. <laughs> you know what, I'm gonna have to give up for now. Um, but the general gist of the formula is nearly here. I'm just too tired to finish it. But the idea is, yeah, we this P prime here is the part, we're not using it, which is the error. Um, that we need to, to fix here. So this this P is what we actually want to return. And the components of it are going to be this V2. Yeah. So once we can fix that though, uh, we could implement two angle. Then we have the transform origin. All our transform points will be mapped and transformed. And we can demonstrate rotation by changing the rotation vector. Um, so that'll be next week. And uh, I'm going to just keep this locally for now. Create a little stash for it. I'll keep a local change. Yeah. Work in progress. Uh, when this change is finished, it will add um, ship rotation to the player ship. Super duper. And that'll be great. Okay. So, if this is your first time joining in, I do these streams once a week, and I do them on Tuesday evenings around 10 after 8 or so. Uh, the best way to get notified uh, when I do stream is just to, of course, follow here on Twitch and, and do that. Um, you'll get notif if your notifications on, you'll get an alert when I go online. Um, sometimes I do do random surprise streams of various things, maybe once in a while. Um, so if you're into that, hit that button. Uh, otherwise, uh, if you're following on YouTube, you know what to do there as well. Uh, and that's what I got for tonight. So thanks for joining me. May all your monads be free. May your types always check. And I'll see you next week. Peace out.